Okay, this is a lecture for my seventh hour class on the um, sixth of uh, sixth of um, April. Okay, and when we left off the other day, we were talking about the Roaring Twenties. We were talking about how after World War One there was disillusionment with the war. You know, there had been a lot of opposition to the war, and you know, people sat and watched the Big Four argue for six months over there at Versailles. Uh, and people had a sense that this treaty was terrible, and it was terrible. Uh, a lot of Americans felt like, you know, we were suckered into this war. They tricked us into the war, uh, and now we're going to come home, and we are never going to go fight in another foreign war. The British and the French tricked us into this war, but that's not going to happen again. Also, during the war, the Russian Revolution had taken place, the largest nation on earth had fallen to communism. And so there's this great fear that swept uh, not just the United States, but the world, that uh, Karl Marx's predictions were coming true, uh, that the communists were going to, uh, to uh, uh, literally take over the world and destroy democracy and destroy capitalism. Uh, and so there's a great fear in the United States. And, you know, when people are afraid, they do, uh, you know, stupid things. Uh, and, of course, uh, one of the things that happens in the United States is that uh, you see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan again. You know, the Klan uh, was on its way to oblivion uh, after the Plessy case in 1896, which uh, uh, legalized segregation in America. I mean, people look at segregation as the law now. There's really no need to have the Ku Klux Klan enforcing segregation. So their numbers were dropping and dropping and dropping. But then two things happened. Number one. In 1912, the first feature-length movie, The Birth of a Nation, uh, was uh, produced, and it was actually shown in the White House by Woodrow Wilson, uh, and that was uh, and that glorified. I'll just you know you know what The Birth of a Nation is. I'm just doing a little review here. That glorified uh, the Ku Klux Klan. That glorified glorified them, not flied them. Glorified the Ku Klux Klan, and the Klan became. Uh, uh, you know, the Klan membership began to grow. But then came World War I, uh, and then came the rise of communism, and then came the Great Red Scare, which uh, starts in the United States after World War I. Uh, and, you know, the government, uh, you know, was uh, afraid that there are alien forces in the United States, immigrants, uh, African-Americans, uh, Roman Catholics, uh, communists, socialists, and they are actively working to overthrow the government. And the government says, we're going to search those people. We're going to find them and we're going to imprison them or we're going to put them out of the country. And the Ku Klux Klan sees an opportunity to get its foot in the door even further. And so the Klan, and this is where I think we left off the other day, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, they uh, pretty much, and by the way, the 1920s is the heyday or the, or, of the Klan. Uh, there will be more um, members in, uh, in the Ku Klux Klan, more people in the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, including in this state. And, and by the way, not just in the South, but Indiana, I think where we left off yesterday was the number one state so far as Klan membership. Uh, they have enormous power. The Klan had enormous power in the United States. Five million people are Ku Klux Klansmen. Uh, and they, uh, you know, uh, burned Jewish businesses. They're going to attack Jews. They're going to attack Roman Catholics. Priests are going to be murdered. There are going to be whippings all over the country. I told you about the Texas bellhop who had the initials KKK burned into his forehead for just attempting to register to vote. Uh, and so in both large cities and in rural areas, small towns across America, the Klan now began to portray itself as the protector of American values. In other words, there's fear that all these foreign forces is, have in, infiltrated America and they're out to destroy it. And the Klan says, we will protect America. We will protect traditional uh, American values. You, we will save you from all these groups that are trying to destroy America. And then in addition to that, get this down, the Klan said, we uh, are going to save uh, family values. Uh, we're here to enforce family values in towns and cities. You know, get this down, and we're going to talk more about this later. But the um, the um, culture of the United States uh, changed dramatically, and we're going to talk all about this. But the culture of the United States changed dramatically uh, in the 1920s. 
uh, all of a sudden, uh, skort, skirts are very, for the first time, you can see women's legs. Uh, you know, they, women cut their hair short and they dye it black. Uh, they're smoking in public and drinking in public. There's this wild dance called the Charleston that's sweeping the country. I'll play you some, I'll show you some people doing the, doing the Charleston. You may want to try that out at the prom, but, uh, there were people doing this wild dance. Uh, you know, drug use went up in the country. Uh, the divorce rate is going to go uh, up uh, in the country. Uh, the abortion rate is going to go up in the country in the 1920s. As I say, the girls are out riding alone in cars, uh, with boys, uh, you know, uh, up until the 1920s, if a young lady who was not, uh, was a, an unmarried young lady wanted to ride in, a, uh, or I guess, uh, well, uh, an unmarried young lady who wanted to go get in a car and go somewhere with uh, uh, a young man, well, uh, you know, their aunt would sit in the back seat. Uh, she would chaperone them on this trip. I don't care if it was here from here to Chicago. You know, uh, before the 1920s, if you went before World War I changed the whole world, uh, including the morals of the world. And, you know, morality, that's what a society determines is right and wrong. And by the way, that's constantly changing. Evidence World War I changed the morality of this country. But, uh, you know, if you wanted to take your girlfriend to the movie, uh, her aunt or, or some uh, female member of the family went with you and sat in the seat uh, behind you uh, at the movie theater. So uh, pre-World War I was a very different world from post-World War I. Uh, women wore uh, makeup, uh, too much makeup, according to the Klan. They smoked uh, in public. Women had always smoked, but they did it in private. Uh, women had always drank, but they usually did it in private, maybe just a little sip of wine. Uh, now on college campuses, word is coming back to these parents that uh, sent their children off to uh, OU with their hard-earned money that their daughters are staying out all night doing this wild dance, riding around in cars with God knows who at 2 o'clock in the morning and getting blotto, that was the word, for just getting so drunk that you just passed out and you, you, you uh, blacked out, I guess, uh, and you didn't remember the next morning where you'd been or what you'd done. And, of course, uh, the older generation in America was concerned about that. And, of course, this change in morality, I'll just say this, we'll talk more about it later, but this change in morality <clears throat> was the fact that, uh, you know, that usually happens after a great crisis, you know, the country had been, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a crisis in, in, in during World War I, literally. Uh, you know, culture had been on knife's edge. We're in a war. And then when the war was over, there's just going to be this great release. Uh, and a lot of these veterans, by the way, that went off to World War I, these young men, and they saw things that nobody should see, but especially when you're 18 or 19 or 20 years old, a lot of these young men came back from the war and they said, our lives are ruined. It's wrecked. We're wrecked. You know, the only thing left for us to do is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, and so, uh, and by the way, this generation, get this down, in the 1920s, they call themselves the lost generation. I don't know, what do they call, I don't, well, you're not even here to answer this question, but uh, what do they, you know, I don't know what they, what they call you. Uh, anyway, uh, we were the baby boomers, and I don't know what you are. Maybe you can tell me when you return on Thursday. But anyway, uh, they call themselves the lost generation. You know, the only part, they said, the, and, and again, I'm speaking in broad general terms, but the, the only purpose of life was pleasure. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And that shocked, that shocked uh, the older, the older uh, generation. And so the Klan steps in, especially in small towns like you follow, the Klan steps in and they said, we're going to save family values. And so guess what they did? Uh, if they caught a young woman uh, riding in a car with a man that she wasn't married to, uh, or she was wearing her dress too short, or she was wearing too much makeup, or she was smoking and drinking in public, uh, they might abduct her and whip her, okay? Whip her, all right? Uh, teenagers who skipped school or drank uh, or used tobacco, they might whip their parents. Uh, you know, dad may, might be getting up to go to work, and out on the windshield of the car, there might be a sign that says the, Klan, the KKK is watching you. And that was your warning. You better get your kids back at school. You better make sure Junior ain't smoking or drinking or your daughter isn't riding around in cars with men uh, at, late at night. Because if this continues, we're coming after you. We're going to go to the root of the problem. We're going to, you know, abduct dad, take him out of the country, maybe tie, 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 tie him up in a tree or throw him across the hood of his car and give him 20 lashes with a whip. Uh, so 
the clan, they become, uh, write this down, the moral arbiters. They take it upon themselves to become the moral arbiters of society, okay? The moral arbiters of society. An arbiter is someone who decides what they're saying. We're the arbiter of morals. We, the Ku Klux Klan in this little town, whatever that town may be, we're going to decide um, what is right and what is wrong. We're going to enforce family values. Here's some, I don't know how well you can see that, but coming up on the prom season, you know, there are some clan chicks. You know, if you're looking for a date, there's a clansman. And he's even, they've even got their horses with white robes on, and there he is carrying the American flag. The clan always at their rallies carries, there will always be two things present. Number one, the American flag, and the other, the, the Holy Bible, okay? And like I say, they were very powerful in Oklahoma. You know, they may have had a majority at one time in the Oklahoma State Legislature. And the Klan in Oklahoma lynched blacks and whites and Native Americans. In fact, between 1885 and 1930, there were a hundred, just think about that, uh, 40 years. In one 40-year period in Oklahoma, there were 147 lynchings in Oklahoma. Excuse me, the phone is ringing. Hello? Okay, I'll do that. Uh, excuse me just a minute. I've got to take care of a matter here. Real quick. Anyway, in a 40-year period, in a 40-year period, the Ku Klux Klan uh, lynched 147 people in Oklahoma, and uh, they were black. They lynched Native Americans, African Americans, and whites that ran afoul of the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, in the year of 1922, there were 2,500 whippings. And just think about that. In 1922, 100 years ago, wow, just 100 years ago, right here in this state, there were 2,500 whippings by the Ku Klux Klan. In Oklahoma, there were over 50, get this now, 50 what they call sundown towns, okay? There's a group of Klansmen at an initiation. There are a group of guys coming in. Uh, we'll get back to these sundown towns, but write that down. But there's the Klan marching. I think, I think in this particular parade, and you can see the Capitol Dome behind them, 250,000 250, Ku Klux Klansmen marched down the street in Washington, D.C., uh, in past the White House, past the Capitol building, okay? Uh, this sign right here says, don't let the sun set on you here, understand? And that, of course, was directed uh, at African Americans. Here's what would happen. Uh, in a community, whites uh, would sign, and I, again, I'm speaking in broad general terms, as you're going to see, not all whites went along with the Klan, but anyway, whites, uh, would uh, decide that they no longer wanted black people to live in their town. You know, I, I'm going to talk, I'm going to just mention the, the Tulsa race riot in a moment. We've already talked about the Tulsa race riot of uh, 1921. And part of the reason for the Tulsa race riot is that white Tulsa had decided they no longer wanted black people to live in Tulsa. They wanted Tulsa to be an all white community. That was part of the motive behind the destruction of Greenwood in Tulsa, the worst race riot in American history, in the 19, in the roaring 20s. That shouldn't surprise anyone. But anyway, whites in the community uh, would decide that they didn't want blacks in their community anymore, uh, and they would attack a black section of the community. 
and they would kill African Americans and burn it to the ground. That's what they did in Tulsa. But by, by the way, this happens in small towns as well. And once they had chased out all uh, the African Americans from their community, they would pass what were called sundown laws to ensure that the community remained all white. Uh, Henrietta was a sundown town. And they would have these signs. You know, black people could come in town and maybe shop. Black people could come in town and maybe work. Uh, but uh, at sundown, you'd better be gone. And that's what this says. Don't let the sun set on your on you here. Understand, uh, after dark, you've got to uh, get out of here. Duran, Oklahoma was one. Norman, the home of the universe. Norman, Oklahoma was a sundown town at one time. Ada, Bartlesville, uh, and my hometown of Marlow. Uh, it was so bad, by the way, the Klan was so bad in this state that uh, Governor Jack Walton uh, at once uh, declared martial law, okay, and um, declared martial law. And, uh, you know, uh, later on, he's impeached. Uh, there were other issues and removed from office. Uh, there are other issues, but I assure you, taking on the Klan didn't help him as governor, as governor of Oklahoma. Well, we have uh, talked about the Tulsa race riot, and so I will not talk about it. I will not talk about it again, except to say that it happened in, in, in May of 1921. It happened in May of 1921. In 35 square blocks of Tulsa, the Greenwood section was burned. That's 1,200 homes and businesses destroyed. Three to 500 people were killed. 800 were wounded in 24 hours. They burned 12 churches, five hotels, 31 restaurants, four pharmacies, eight doctor's offices, 25 grocery stores, and a public library in just 24 hours in just 24 uh, hours, okay? Uh, it took the National Guard and troops from Fort Sill, Oklahoma, it took the National Guard and troops from Fort Sill, Oklahoma to restore order uh, in, in, in Tulsa, in Tulsa. And uh, in many ways, the uh, Greenwood, uh, of course, one of, uh, it, it hasn't fully recovered, but one of the things is that after, the, 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 you know, you, you talk about the Greenwood massacre, as horrible as it was, but one of the, uh, most inspiring parts of that story is that uh, these African Americans came back uh, and they rebuilt their community. The rebuilding of, of, of um, uh, Greenwood is a, a certainly a, a real triumph over adversity, and, and very little is given is given to that. After I want to say this though, we get this down. After the Greenwood massacre in Oklahoma, worst race riot in the history of the country. Uh, Black and white Oklahomans, black and white Oklahomans came together to break the Klan, the power of the Klan in Oklahoma, and they're going to succeed. In other words, enough blacks and enough whites came together and said, we do not want to live in a state that is dominated by a terrorist organization called the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and in 1923, under pressure from these groups, the state legislature passed an anti-masking law. Uh, and uh, uh, these African Americans, uh, in other words, uh, you know, uh, one of the ways that, that the Klan maintain, well, the, the way they maintain their anonymity, in other words, you can go commit a horrible crime, but if your face is covered, you're not going to be persecuted or prosecuted for that, or persecuted, you're not going to be prosecuted for that. So they said, well, you can, you know, uh, the, when the Klan has these rallies, you know, you can wear your hood and your uh, bed sheet, I guess, but your face you have to show your face, okay? And that did a lot uh, to take away power from the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, here are the names, and you don't have to write these down, but here are the names of some of the, uh, the organizations that formed in Oklahoma after the Tulsa race riot, the disgraceful and violent Tulsa race riot uh, to, uh, to, to, to combat the Klan. There was the Association of Southern Women opposed to the Ku Klux Klan. These are all Oklahoma organizations. Uh, anti the anti the black and whites belong to this. The anti Ku Klux Klan All American Association. Another one in Oklahoma was called the Sons and Daughters of Liberty, and the message was: We are not going to live under the tyranny of the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan are not going to run the state of Oklahoma. The people of Oklahoma, all the people of Oklahoma, are. Uh, the last lynching in Oklahoma actually took place in Chickasha, Oklahoma, though in, in nineteen in nineteen thirty. And I want you to write this down, President Harding, okay? Uh, here are some 
Uh, you may or may not be able to see this, but there is a man that is lynched. Uh, there's a lynching. I've probably shown you some of these before. There are three black men uh, lynched. Uh, there is a church burning at Greenwood, okay, set on fire by the mob. And many, if not all of those, uh, well, you never can't say all, but many of those people in the uh, Tulsa race riot were members of the Ku Klux Klan. There is Greenwood. I hope you can see that. There is Greenwood burning, okay? <clears throat> uh, and there are some men uh, being taken prisoner. African Americans are being taken prisoner and marched to downtown Tulsa during the uh, Greenwood race riot. There are people going down to see it. Uh, there's Miss Lucille Figure. She was a uh, survivor. Uh, I think she died in 2012, something like that. But she was one of the last survivors of the Greenwood race riot. And uh, there's Dr. Olivia Ford. Oh, uh, not Ford, Olivia Hooker. And she uh, taught it at Fordham University is what I meant to say. And there she is being given uh, an award in the White House by President Obama. I think I've shown you these pictures before. But one of the great stories of Greenwood that uh, I will say it again, that is seldom told, it's how they came back. Certainly we ought to remember the race riot, uh, but uh, we also need to remember that uh, these people overcame that, that horrible situation. And even, and, and I shouldn't say even, President Warren Harding, that's who I'm trying to find here. We'll come back to these guys. Um, President Harding, there he is. President Harding is, a, and we're going to talk all about the election of 1920. It's an interesting election, but he was elected in 1920. Okay. He's the guy that said back to normalcy. I think we put that down the other day, back to normalcy. In other words, he said, you know, the United, our, the, 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 our world saving is over. We're not going to go out to save the world anymore. Uh, and he, his election uh, he's a Republican. He's a conservative Republican. His election uh, symbolizes America's turn to isolationism beginning in 1920. Uh, and, uh, you know, Warren Harding is always rated as one of the worst presidents. I'll tell you the story of Harding and you'll see why. But President Harding uh, said this uh, during the 1920s concerning the Klan. And it took a lot of courage because the Klan had a lot of support in this country. Uh, it took a lot of courage for a president to say this. Uh, and he went down to Alabama to give a speech. And boy, Alabama was like Oklahoma. It was really Klan country. Um, but he said this. Uh, he, 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 actually, he actually went to Lincoln University, uh, which was called the Black Princeton. I may have him in the wrong place. He did go to Alabama and make a speech. But Lincoln University, he went there, which was uh, called the Black Princeton. I'm sorry, I see here it's the, the speech. I want. He did give one in Alabama, too, in which he condemned the Klan. And that took a, a tremendous amount of courage. But this speech, this quote that I'm going to give you, he went to uh, Lincoln, Pennsylvania, to uh, Lincoln University, which was an all-black uh, university. It was one of the uh, freedmen schools established at the end of the Civil War. But anyway, he said this. He said that riots in Tulsa, you know, well, let me just back up a minute. You know, just the fact that this white president would go down and speak at an all-black school, that raised the eyebrows of a lot of people in this country. A lot of Southern newspapers condemned him. They said, you don't have any business, Mr. President, going down and speaking to, giving a commencement address at an all-black school. But he did. And he said that riots like the one in Tulsa, 1921, that should never happen again. And uh, he sent an anti-lynching bill to Congress. And then, now I'm going to go to Alabama. And I've got the, you know, uh, that's what he said at Lincoln University. And by the way, he sends an anti-lynching bill to make lynching a federal crime. I think he's well, maybe the second president only to do that. It's not going to pass. It's not going to get through the Congress, but he had the courage to do it. And then, I'm getting myself straightened out here, then he went to Birmingham, Alabama, in front of an all-white audience, and I have no doubt that there were members of the Ku Klux Klan sitting in that auditorium that day, and he said this, and this was, again, very, you know, of all the things we can say about Harding, this, this took a lot of courage. 
uh, and I quote, he said, I believe Negro citizens should be guaranteed the full enjoyment of all rights. Their sacrifice in blood upon the battlefields of the Republic have entitled them to all of the freedom and opportunity that Americans, that the, excuse me, that the American spirit of fairness and justice demands, end quote. Very courageous on the part of President Harding, which will take us, which will take us to the election of 1920, okay? Uh, let's go back here. So it will take us to the election of 1920. Uh, and by 1920, get this down, the country was tired of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, they were tired of this uh, progressive idea that it was America's duty to save the world and to make the world safe for democracy and to go send our sons to die in the, across the world to make sure that no war ever happened again. In short, World War I killed the progressive era. And now, get this down, in the wake of, look, look, it's just like this. Um, it's like this. Nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty. That's the progressive era. That's the liberal progressive era. Okay, but World War, but beginning in nineteen twenty, uh, for the next twelve years until nineteen thirty-two, America took a conservative, isolationist turn. You know, we're going. We're going to concern ourselves with our own country. We're separated. This is the attitude. We're separated from the rest of the world by two broad oceans. Uh, if we're attacked, we will defend ourselves, but we're not going to go overseas looking for trouble. That's the attitude until the day that the, really the Japanese bombed uh, Pearl Harbor. Well, so... The Democrats that year, get this down, nominated these two young men, all right? Well, one young man who was slightly middle-aged. Uh, James Cox, and you can write him down if you want to. He's the Democrat candidate for president. I think he was the governor of Ohio. But here's the star of the election right there. Even though he loses, here's the star of the election. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. They say, you know, the great ones by their initials, FDR. This is the first election. He's running for vice president. This is, And they're going to lose. Cox and Roosevelt are going to lose. But this is the first time that Roosevelt stepped out on uh, the uh, national stage in politics. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was the cousin to arguably the most popular, arguably the most popular president in American history, T.R. Teddy Teddy Roosevelt uh, and the Republicans were genu ge the Republican uh, excuse me the Roosevelt family they were generally Republicans but Franklin Roosevelt's branch of the family Franklin Roosevelt's branch of the Roosevelts they were Democrats and get this down in 1920 uh, Cox and Roosevelt or the Democrat Party campaign they said if we are elected, we will again send the Treaty of Versailles to the Senate for ratification, and we will join the League of Nations because we Democrats believe that America has to play its part in world affairs, okay, world affairs. And of course, the biggest question, as I wrote to you the other day, wrote down the other day, the biggest question in this election, well, there's Franklin Roosevelt, the young man, star of the election. That guy will be elected president of the United States four times. There he is. But the big question was, would America be internationalist? Would we be involved all over the world? Or would we be isolationist and keep to ourselves? And the Democrats said, we must be involved all over the world. Well, the Democrats went on to lose this election. The Democrats went on to lose. But Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, made such an impression on the country. 
Now, he had a magnificent speaking voice. I will play some uh, recordings of Roosevelt to you. But, uh, you know, he was young. He was dynamic. There, there are he and Cox uh, marching in a parade, and you can see Roosevelt. Maybe you can see him, but there he is waving to the crowd. Famous Roosevelt smile. Uh, but they lost. But he was so impressive. Roosevelt was so impressive that people were already saying about him, that young man is going to be president someday. And when this campaign was over, Roosevelt and his campaign advisors huddled together uh, and they started planning for 1924. They lose in 1920, the next elections in 1924. We're coming up on the 100th anniversary of that in a couple of years. Our next election is 2024. And uh, Roosevelt uh, and his advisors start to, uh, uh, you know, uh, planning for 2024. And they say, Frank, you'll be the Democrat nominee for president. And in 2024, you will win. Uh, well, after the election, you know, campaigns are pretty grueling. After the election, uh, Roosevelt and his family went to uh, Campobello Island up in Canada. They went up there. That's where the Roosevelts would traditionally vacation. And the Roosevelts were sea people. They liked sailing and swimming. You know, they're water people. And, uh, you know, Roosevelt was there, and he and his family, he had a wife, and I think he's got five children, and they're just having the time of their life, relaxing from the campaign, but at the same time, getting ready for already, in 1921, already starting the plan for the next campaign. And one of his campaign aides said to him, you know, he said, hey, Frank, he said, just down the road here, uh, there are a group of Boy Scouts. They're having this big summer encampment. And he said, wouldn't that be great, you know, for you to go down there and just have lunch with them? And, uh, you know, just say a few words. Let those boys see a guy who actually ran for vice president. And Roosevelt said, oh, I don't want to go down there with a bunch of Boy Scouts. He's, they said, yeah, come on and go down there. Because you know what? When these boys go home, they'll go back home all over the country. And when they go back home, they will, uh, the, 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 the most thrilling thing that would have happened, will have happened to them was that they got to see the president, vice pre, a guy who had run for vice president of the United States. They actually met the great Franklin Roosevelt. They said, that's the best free advertising in the world. It'll go to all, all 48 states. And Roosevelt thought about it and said, well, I'll go. So he went, and I don't know how well you can see this picture, but there's Roosevelt, and here's a group of Boy Scouts, and he's having his picture made with them. And that's the last photograph taken of Franklin Roosevelt ever standing up on his own, okay? Because at that camp, at that camp, uh, he caught, he uh, contracted from one of those boys, one of those boys, or maybe more than one, had the virus of, uh, of the polio virus. Uh, I think it's polio myelitis, okay? It's what, polio, okay? Write that down, polio. He contracted that. And he's only 39 years old. Went home, you know, had his picture, had lunch, said a few words, maybe signed a few autographs. And then he went home in the next couple of days, you know, uh, the Roosevelts were all out swimming and the sun is starting to set. And uh, he decides to stay out and just let the water just sit by the, you know, you've probably done this out at the cove, sit there and just let the water splash over your feet. His wife and the children went home and they all had dinner and she put his dinner in the stove to keep it warm. And he's sitting down there and finally he decides, you know, it's getting dark, it's time to go back up to the house. And so he starts walking and he's kind of stiff he gets up to the house, and his wife said, your supper is in the stove. Roosevelt said, uh, you know, my neck is kind of hurting. He said, you know, he said, I think I'm getting the flu. And he, he said, and he went up, got undressed, and went to bed. And he never took another step in his life. He's 39 years old. He never took another step in his life. In 24 hours, he went from a vigorous, healthy, athletic, wealthy young father to a man who would be confined uh, into a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He will never take another step on his own. Now, I will show you, you know, the, the great myth about Roosevelt, though, is we're going to see as we go through this, is that, that, you know, Roosevelt will convince the American public that he can walk again, that he has overcome, he has overcome polio. Uh, and I will show you a film clip, and Roosevelt appears to be walking. You can't see me now, but you're just, just like I'm walking right here. He's waving. He appears to be walking. He is not. Uh, it took him a decade.
to develop that illusion that he could walk. Uh, and people that remembered Roosevelt, my mother remembered Roosevelt, and she remembered years later, when it 20 years after his death, when it came out that Roosevelt couldn't walk, that Roosevelt was confined to a wheelchair. She was shocked at that. She said, yeah, we knew he'd had polio, but he overcame that. Uh, and we'll talk about how Roosevelt hid the fact that he never really recovered from polio. But he is, he is the, uh, he is uh, the uh, uh, elected president four times. You know, I often say, do you think that this kind of people in this country today would vote for someone who in a wheelchair? And students all say, yes, well, that's very kind of you. And I hope that's true. And I hope it's true so far as the country's concerned. But I don't know if we would or not. Uh, I think we might look at someone who was confined to a wheelchair and say they're just not up to it. They can't deal with the pressure of the presidency. Well, let me tell you something. Franklin Roosevelt took this country <coughs> through arguably the two greatest crises it ever faced, the Great Depression for 12 years and then World War One, World War II, excuse me, uh, for four years. So, yeah, I think, you know, uh, quite capable, quite capable. Uh, you know, he was he's one of our strongest presidents. I mean, the only president stronger than him that I can think of is Abraham, Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Lincoln, uh, and maybe they're equal in their strength. I don't know. But anyway, well, the Republicans get this down and we'll stop here. The Republicans, the Republicans, um, now felt certain that they were going to win. They said, people are tired of Wilson. They're tired of world saving. People are looking at the war and they're saying the war was a, was a fraud we should have never fought in it. We were tricked into it. So this is our year. And by the way, it was a Republican year. In 1920, there was no way the Democrats could win. And Republicans knew that. And so uh, every Republican in the country, every leading Republican, governor, senator, mayor, whoever thought he might like to be president, they're going to show up at the Republican convention of 1920 they're going to show up at the Republican convention of 1920 trying to get the Republican nomination. Because if you get the Republican nomination in 1920, you're going to be president. And uh, they all know that. And so when we come back uh, tomorrow, we will take up the Republican National Convention of 1920.